Thanks, Dave. Good evening. <clears throat> you know, we say this morning, I said uh, shalom. And in Israel, uh, we say shalom for hello. And we say shalom for goodbye. And we say shalom for peace. Um, peace is an overriding factor in our lives. But when we say shalom for hello and shalom for goodbye, sometimes we're not sure whether we're coming or going. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles with you this evening, don't you just love the people that say to you, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, turn with me please to uh, Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> I just have a few introductory uh, comments and then we'll deal with the situation as it is today uh, along with your questions. Matthew 22, uh, look at verse 15. Verse 15, we have, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. Now, you know that uh, Pharisees were a uh, ruling party, ruling religious party, and uh, they were joined at that time by the Sadducees. <clears throat> and the Sadducees are not kept out of Scripture, so if you please turn to verse 23, same chapter. We have uh, on that day some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and questioned him, saying, Teacher uh, Moses said, now let me just stop for a minute. Same day, so you have both the Pharisees who are trying to trap uh, the Lord Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua is Hebrew for uh, Jesus. And the Sadducees later that same day who are trying to trap the Lord Yeshua. It wasn't one of those easy days. Everybody was trying to, to catch him in a situation. But what they said was, Teacher Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they had all married her. You know, I look at this, and there's a great question, but I think that the question really should have been, you know, what was it about this woman that was causing all these men to die? <laughs> And what the Lord did was that he basically, he didn't ignore it, but he didn't answer it the way that they had expected. And what he said to them is, uh, Yeshua answered and said to them, you are, let me just stop for a second, why Yeshua? Okay, in Matthew 121, it says, you shall call his name uh, Jesus for, because uh, uh, he is the one that will bear their sins. He will be the one that will save them from their sins. And in English, you know, you call his name uh, Jesus, which is taken from Jesus, which is Greek, which is really taken from Hebrew Yeshua. And Yeshua has the root of Yesha, like Yeshua. Yesha means uh, to save. So you will call his name, in Hebrew, you will call his name Savior because he will save. It makes a lot of sense in Hebrew. In English, we try to call his name Jesus, and I don't mean any disrespect, you can call his name Joe. It wouldn't make any sense to us, but in Hebrew it makes perfect sense. So uh, Yeshua is uh, Jesus in Hebrew, and I may say Jesus, I may say Yeshua, but at least we know who, uh, who I mean. He says, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection, remember, Sadducees are those who did not believe in the resurrection, and the Apostle Paul took advantage of that later on to create a, a conflict between the Pharisees and the Sadducees when he was defending himself before the, uh, the Jewish leaders. Said for, but regarding the resurrection of the dead, 
have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The idea here is when we say, when the scriptures indicate that I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, it is a, essentially a formula, particularly in the book of Matthew, which is written primarily for a Jewish audience, that it is a formula for remembering that this is the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant uh, was repeated also back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. We go back a little ways, and we go back even a little further to Genesis chapter 12, uh, in verse 3, where God made a promise to Abraham, which he later repeated to Isaac, and then he repeated again to Jacob, that promise being referred to as the Abrahamic promise, which contained two essential factors. One, I will make you a great, pe great nation, i.e., I will give you people. I will make of you a great people. And second, I will give you land. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay, we're not going to look at all the scriptures. That's a general synopsis of, of the picture. But why is the Lord saying, you err because you do not know the scriptures? The promise of Abraham that was given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob of a people and of a land was not realized by either Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. And according to Hebrews, we read that they all died without receiving the promise. So in order for God not to be made a liar, he has to raise up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the dead, therefore answering the question of the Sadducees concerning the resurrection from the dead. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be resurrected in order for God to fulfill his promise to them. But the promise is what is essential here, that I will make of you a great people and I will give you a land. That Abrahamic promise has been carried through. The attempt of the enemy of our souls over the ages has been to negate the Abrahamic covenant. And an attempt has been made to destroy the Jewish people in the Old Testament time after time War has come against Israel. In Psalm 83, we read that uh, the nations around have sought to conspire together, saying, come, let us destroy them as a people that the name of Israel would be no more. If there is no Israel, the Abrahamic covenant cannot be completed. God would be a liar. Let's all close the book and go home. All right, we are still all in our sins, we have no hope, and that's not what God's message is for us. But why is it essential for the Jewish people to remain as a Jewish people? Because in Matthew chapter 23, if you turn with us, and uh, from this point we'll, we'll move on, in verse 37, 38, 39, it says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I had wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you, for I say to you, that's the house of Israel, from now on you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's another statement which is a messianic invitation that Israel will not see the Lord until they call upon the name of the Lord. In other words, the Lord won't come until Israel calls out to the Lord to come. And so we who wait for the return of the Lord need to pray for Israel, pray for the Jewish people, that the time will come that they will turn and seek the Lord and call upon him, which will happen at a certain point uh, in the future, when war comes upon them, when two-thirds of Israel is killed, one-third that remains, a nation will be born in a day, they will cry out in a national prayer of repentance, according to Isaiah 53, who has believed our report, for he grew up before us like a tender shoot, and so on. 
that they will have a national prayer of repentance calling upon the Messiah and they shall look upon me, God says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him, that's the son, as one mourns for an only begotten son. And so the attempt has been, if you destroy the Jewish people, the Messiah can't come the first time. That was the attempt in the Old Testament. And then when Rachel was weeping for her children, the attempt was to kill the Messiah so that he would not become the king of Israel. And Herod's attempt was to prevent the coming king, Messiah. And throughout the ages, the enemy of our soul, Satan, has used various individuals, various nations to come against the Jewish people in order to destroy the Jewish people. Why? If, there's no, if there are no Jewish people, there is no national prayer of repentance. If there's no national prayer of repentance, according to what the Messiah himself has said, he will not come until the people, until, until the Jewish people call out for him. If there's no Jewish people, he won't come. In other words, there will not be a second coming. Okay? That's the big picture in a nutshell. And what is happening today is an attempt to turn the Abrahamic covenant around. I will make of you a great people, and I will give you a land. And what is happening is that the nations around who are all followers of Islam are basically saying, we will kill your people and we will take your land, i.e., we will negate the Abrahamic covenant. There will be no nation of Israel. There will be no national repentance. There will be no calling upon the Lord. The Lord will not come. So should we pray for Israel? Yes. In a big picture? Yes, definitely. You want the Lord to return? I want the Lord to return. With all my heart, I want the Lord to return. But he's not going to return to Tonkanic. Did I say that right? Okay. Okay. I thought it was Tonkanic. Uh, he is going to return where he said he was going to return. And that's in Israel, to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel, in the time that has set, been set forth for his return. So we need to pray that that would come. If we pray, come, Lord Jesus, we need to pray and remember to pray for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people that the blindness that has now come upon them, the hardness of their hearts would become soft, the blindness would be removed, that they would look upon the Lord and call upon his name. That's the big picture. <clears throat> What's happening today? God loves us, everybody hates us, let's go home. <laughs> um, we have situations, the Middle East is, is like a powder keg ready to explode. Uh, to the southwest we have uh, turmoil in Egypt. Uh, two and a half, almost three years ago when Mubarak was uh, removed from power after almost 30 years and he had received much backing from, from the West. Uh, he left a major vacuum. The people were crying out, give us food, give us jobs, help us to take care of our families. We want to work. We want to live decently. And the Arab Spring was intended to accomplish that. The Arab Spring, or the revolution in a sense in Egypt, was hijacked uh, by the Muslim Brotherhood, who had placed uh, Mohammed Morsi in position of power, who immediately went ahead and tried to change the Constitution and make uh, the, uh, the, the existing rulership uh, invincible and uh, exempt from any attempt to remove them and to give himself universal powers. Uh, and that didn't fly, and people recognized that they stole the rebellion or the revolution, and they wanted him removed. So you have the military that stepped in, and the uh, United States says, okay, that's not going to work out. We're going to cut off the funds for the military. Um, but that doesn't work very well, because if they cut it off, then you have a major, major situation of upheaval in Egypt where 
there's nobody to step in except those who have power. Who has the power? The Muslim Brotherhood. So they were deposed and they will come right back in, making matters worse. Muslim Brotherhood does not have any love for Israel. I'm being kind. They do not have any love for Israel. They would be thrilled to pieces uh, if they were able to lead uh, an attack against Israel and drive all the Jews into the sea. That's to the southwest. To the immediate north, we have Lebanon. Now, in Lebanon, uh, we also have uh, the Hezbollah. And uh, the Hezbollah uh, do not like Israel. In 2006, they decided to send some 4,000 missiles into the north of Israel, um, including Haifa. And Haifa suffered the greatest civilian casualty loss of the 33-day uh, incursion. Uh, we suffered a loss of 12 individuals, which was the largest of any other city or municipality uh, in the north. It put the third, top third of Israel uh, into a state of suspended animation. Nothing moved, nothing came in, nothing went out. People were in sheltered areas. Um, no businesses were functioning, no vehicles were going anywhere. I mean, you might see one vehicle, two vehicles, or an ambulance here and there, but basically the entire north of Israel, approximately two, thousand, two million people were stopped in their tracks. So there's no great love uh, coming from Lebanon, and right now, instead of the 4,000 missiles that they had sent in 2006, they now have a stockpile of some 60,000 missiles, which has been verified. Um, which they are just ready to fire in our direction. And Nasrallah, who's the head of the Hezbollah, said that they can reach anywhere using a biblical term from Dan to Be'er Sheva, meaning that from the north all the way down to the south, they can reach any point uh, in Israel. And if they can't reach it, they have help from the, uh, from the folks along the Mediterranean that are in an area known as Gaza, uh, biblically referred to as Aza. Um, they have been firing missiles into Israel for the past dozen years. Uh, the Operation Cast Lead, when we went into Gaza, was an attempt to destroy their infrastructure, their military infrastructure, uh, essentially with pinpoint uh, bombing. And to a very, very, very large extent, we had succeeded, and things have somewhat quieted down from uh, Gaza, although there have been missiles. You may not have read about it or heard about it, but they continue to send missiles, seeing what kind of response uh, Israel is going to make. Okay, so we have Egypt that doesn't love us, Gaza who doesn't love us, the Hezbollah who doesn't love us, Syria doesn't love us. Uh, Syria has lost about 120,000 people at this point during the uh, civil war that's going on over, the, over there to remove Bashir al-Assad, uh, who was Hafez al-Assad's uh, son. And he was actually a, an, uh, uh, ophthalm, uh, ophthalm, an eye doctor. <laughs> Ophthalmologist. That's what I said, OK? <laughs> an ophthalmologist. I knew that it was in there somewhere. Just had to, I kind of got stuck, you know? Um, he was an ophthalmologist by profession, didn't really want to get into uh, politics, but after his father died, his older brother was supposed to take over, and somehow his older brother was killed in a car accident. Don't ask, I won't tell you. Okay, but uh, he came in. Is he better than his father? No. Is he worse than his father? Probably. Um, what is happening there? You have an internal religious uh, struggle between Shiite and Sunni Muslims. Uh, now, um, Bashir al-Assad is uh, an Alawite. And an Alawite Muslim is an offshoot of Shiite Muslim. Uh, and they are a very small minority, uh, but a ruling minority over a Sunni majority, which does not create for uh, loving relations between the Sunnis and the Shiites, and particularly the Alawites, who have centuries of conflict between them. 
And so what's going on in Syria is really a, a uh, struggle between cousins. Uh, this one believes that, and that one believes something else. And then we have the alignments that are in the area. Iran, uh, who is trying to nuke everybody in the world, starting with Israel, they don't love us either, uh, they are Shiite. Lebanon is Shiite. The Hezbollah is Shiite. Uh, so Iran supplies the Hezbollah through Syria. And so you have the, the connection of the three uh, countries, all of whom do not like Israel, who would love to see Israel destroyed. So if, if Syria, if the Syrian connection is interrupted, the flow of weapons from Iran to the Hezbollah gets interrupted as well. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. I'm trying to kind of give you the broad uh, perspective of what it is, but basically you have a situation that uh, you have the unholy um, uh, threesome uh, that have, yeah, I'm trying to uh, keep it more secular, you know, I don't want to give them any kind of validity, but you have the three of them that basically uh, are Shiite or Alawite Shiite uh, who want to have Israel destroyed, but Syria has been kind of quiet uh, since 1973. And now everything has come up again, and some of the uh, combatants have actually crossed the border into Israel, and Israel has been treating both sides of the Syrian conflict, neither of, uh, of which are, are happy that Israel is doing that. Um, but there's another conflict, because the Hezbollah is Shiite, and they sent fighters from Lebanon into Syria to do what? to fight against the Sunnis, who are the, re the rebels against Assad's regi regime, which caused the Hezbollah to lose favor in uh, Lebanon because they are sending Shiites to fight against Sunnis, and those in Lebanon see the Sunnis as their kin. And so they don't want cousin fighting cousin, and so it's a whole mess uh, in the area. Jordan, we are at peace with Jordan so far. Uh, and Jordan cannot afford a war with Israel because they know that they, they have no chance of succeeding. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, is loaded with money and oil. And they had been supplying uh, uh, those nice folks who attacked the World Trade Center and uh, blew it up with all the funds that they need, and they supply finances to most of the terrorist organizations around the world, including Al-Qaeda. So Israel is a great neighborhood if you want to come and live there. Uh, you just know that you're in the middle of a hotbed that's ready to explode and everybody hates you. So I don't know why the real estate there is so expensive, you know, <laughs> trying to figure that one out. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but you know, it's not only that they're a Jewish landlord, they're Jewish tenants also. You know, try to figure that one out. Anyway, that's the big picture from a uh, military situation. There is something new that has uh, come up. The question is always, what is Israel going to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Iran wants to blow up uh, Israel. They are building, uh, they have nuclear facilities and they are trying to build nuclear weapons. Uh, how is that going to pan out? Well, we have another player in the region, a small country called Russia. Uh, now, Russia uh, lost a lot of uh, prestige when the wall came down and the former Union of Soviet Socialists Republic, uh, the USSR, collapsed, and then it became all, a whole bunch of independent states. Uh, with lots of nuclear weapons in each one of them that some maniac can press a button on. Uh, and now they are trying to gain or regain their prestige around the world. <clears throat> but what's happening? 
they are interfering in the affairs of the Middle East by supplying weapons and war materials to Syria, and they have a stack of warships that are located in the Mediterranean that are already there. And so they are threatening that if somebody from outside, like the United States or Israel, if Syria is attacked, Russia is going to retaliate on behalf of uh, Syria. And you know, the question is, why in the world would they do that? Well, because Russia is also involved with Iran. Now, Iran sued Russia for $4 billion because Russia broke a uh, military contract. They were supposed to supply uh, certain aircraft and anti-aircraft and uh, war materials to Iran, which they didn't supply. And Iran, believe it or not, decided to take the matter to court. Ha! I mean, you really need to think about that one. But sued Russia for all this money for breach of contract. And Russia didn't want to be sued because it doesn't have money. But it has the ability and it has weapons. So it said, OK, we're going to supply you with aircraft and anti-aircraft and all kinds of weapons, withdraw your lawsuit, fine. But they threw in a bonus, and we're going to help you build a nuclear reactor. That's only in the last month and a half. So it's uh, an alliance that was made in hell, Russia and, and Iran. This one had what this one needs. This one could supply what that one didn't have. And so they decided to go together. And now Russia comes into the Middle East arena. Why in the world would they want to do that? You know. Well, you see, a few years ago, Israel discovered natural gas in the uh, Mediterranean just off the northern coast of Haifa. That's where we live. And uh, there is enough natural gas to supply the needs of Israel and lots of other places for at least the next 50 to 60 years. At least. Now, Russia already controls about 75% of the natural gas in the world, but they want more. And if they can control all of the natural gas, notwithstanding that Israel is supposed to get some natural gas from Egypt, uh, and the, there are terrorists who blow up the gas pipeline on a regular basis, uh, then Russia would be able to control almost all of the natural gas resources throughout the world, giving them incredible power uh, and the ability to maneuver and dictate terms to countries all over the world. And on top of that, oil was just discovered also in Israeli territory just off the coast. And so maybe five years ago, when we look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, which we've been looking at intensively, uh, the reason for the invasion from the north, and by the way, Moscow is directly north of Jerusalem, um, the reason for the Russian invasion, the reason that was given for the intended northern invasion uh, of Israel is for the spoils, uh, the spoils of war. And the only realistic spoils about five years ago uh, were the things that were found in the Dead Sea, namely salt and minerals. But enough salt and minerals to supply the world's needs for dozens of years to come. And if you supply the world's supply, if you control the world's supply of salt, you are also in a position of power and influence, as well as the, the materials and the minerals that are found there are healing. And there are mineral spas all over the Dead Sea uh, area. But now, spoils of war, Dead Sea, well, you need to work to get the materials out of the Dead Sea, but we have natural gas and we have oil. And so there are greater incentives for Russia to get involved, plus the fact that they also have some property uh, located in Jerusalem. They want to make sure that the property is under their control. In fact, not only the little property that they have in Jerusalem, they'd kind of like to expand that little property all over uh, Israel. So those are the essential players. Where does the United States fit in? That's a good question. Um, actually, 
The United States is not mentioned anywhere in scripture. Uh, and that is good. However, it does have power and it does have influence. And how that power and influence is going to be worked out in the next few months or year or two, we need to keep an eye on. You know, there are some who say that uh, the leadership of America is this, that, or the other thing. Uh, we may believe that. There may be some truth to, for a basis to believe uh, that, but I think we need to see how things are going to work out. We should not impose our thinking on the scripture. Let the scripture speak to us as circumstances unfold. Okay, so that's the present situation. Um, militarily and the big picture as to what's happening uh, in Israel. So if you get rid of Israel, you get rid of the Jewish people, you undo the Abrahamic covenant, no national prayer of repentance, no second coming. The war is coming, it's right around the corner, there is, an, there is a, a, a sense of war and about three weeks ago, when it was believed that the United States would, in fact, attack Syria, you know, they didn't really intend to hurt Syria. They just wanted to kind of show them that they were able to do something. It did create somewhat of a panic among certain sections in Israel, those who did not have gas masks. All right, and if you've never had, uh, an opportunity to put on a, a gas mask or to experience what it's like for a missile to fall in your neighborhood, I invite you all to Israel, okay? You need to pay your own ticket. That's the situation, okay? Any questions so far? Nancy. Uh, they are. Okay. What are they essentially? Um, Israel is a Jewish democratic country. We do not have a written constitution. We have what is called basic laws. You put all the basic laws together and we have the equivalent of a constitution, but we don't have a formal constitution. Uh, it is Jewish democratic. The Jewish aspect is made up of mostly secular you would have, I would say, about 15% uh, who are Orthodox, 15, 20%. That would be the extent of it. Uh, the rest of them uh, would be essentially secular. Um, now, the secular could be reformed, conservative, um, and some others. Or they don't believe at all. They don't believe in God. Uh, they could be. They could believe in uh, uh, Buddha. They can believe in whatever they want to believe in, uh, and that would be fine. Uh, I mean, that would be fine vis-a-vis -vis the government. If you could prove that you're Jewish, you can come and, and immigrate to Israel if you make a declaration of your desire to live there, unless you believe in Yeshua. All right. Now, why? Because in 19. 89, on Christmas Day, 1989, the Supreme Court of the State of Israel ruled regarding three Messianic families, uh, one couple who were Jewish from both sides, a second couple where the husband was Jewish and the wife was not, and a third couple where the wife was Jewish and the husband was not, but they were all Messianic, and they applied for immigration under Israel's law of return that says that any Jew from anywhere in the world who makes a declaration that he wants to settle in Israel, is able to come to Israel and acquire Israeli citizenship. And so the question came up whether a Messianic Jew who believes uh, in the basic tenets of Christianity, the, uh, the virgin birth, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the second coming, uh, and so on, can someone like that be considered uh, Jewish for the purpose of law of return? And they said no. They went into a very lengthy explanation, um, and it goes contrary to halakha. Halakha is uh, rabbinical, uh, rabbinical thought and rabbinical decisions as to how a, an Orthodox Jew should live. Halakha says if you're born Jewish, 
you remain Jewish. Doesn't matter what you believe, even if you eat pork, you still remain Jewish. Uh, if you're converted to Judaism, you still remain Jewish, even if you believe something else. If you believe in, uh, in uh, Zen Buddhism, if you believe in uh, uh, Hare Krishna, if you believe in uh, Joe Schmo, it doesn't really matter. The point is that you remain Jewish. But if you believe in Yeshua, uh, then you are considered, even if you are born Jewish, you are considered a member of another religion under the law of return. And that was something that they added to prevent people who believe in Yeshua from immigrating to Israel. There were a number of cases that came up uh, along those lines. Hmm? You were involved in I was involved with some of them, yeah. yeah. So it's, not a lo it's no longer a matter of what you do or even what you are. It's a matter of what you believe that became the test. Okay, so if you believe this, uh, I mean, I believe that the, the court went too far afield. Uh, you know, and they made your belief the test of whether or not you, you are able to immigrate under the law of return. Uh, I think they were wrong, uh, but that's the present law. So that creates a situation if somebody who is Jewish and wants to come to live in Israel, um, in recent years the question has been asked specifically uh, uh, by many, um, many places where they make an application, uh, you know, you need to fill out a form and it says, uh, are you Jewish? Yes. Uh, uh, are you, is your mother Jewish? Yes. If your mother is not Jewish but your father is Jewish, you can still come in. Or if your grandparents are Jewish, you can still come in. Uh, but it says, are you Jewish? Yes. Orthodox, conservative, reformed, other. If you check other, you may be asked very specifically, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? If the answer, you know, and then you're faced with a situation. If I say yes, I may be denied entry to Israel under the law of return. I may not get citizenship. If I say no, you're facing a situation where you're denying the Lord. So it's not an easy, uh, not an easy situation. Yes, there was a question there. Yeah. Okay, can't hear you. Okay, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I have not been invited to sit in on cabinet sessions. What's the papers? The papers say, depends on whether or not you have a liberal paper, or a left-wing paper, or you have a right-wing paper. A right-wing paper is very careful about what it says, but would usually say the United States is kind of missing, uh, uh, missing its role vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Israel is kind of wishy-washy and Israel recognizes that uh, there are powers that be that are influencing things that are going on in the Middle East but they're not going to come out and they're going to say you're making everybody hate me and it's all your fault shame on you they're not going to do that you know because Israel still looks to the possibility that at some point if we go it alone vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran we're still going to need some supplementary military relief in the event of an all-out war. But is it scarier for them now as far as they knew who Assad was? Well, it's scarier in is it, the Muslim Brotherhood are the rebels and Al Qaeda coming in to, to get them out of power. Is that scarier for Israel or no? You know, Israel has been through so many wars. Uh, I don't think that we scare easily, and I, I don't mean to be facetious. Israel does not scare easily. Uh, our military is extremely well trained. I'm extremely well trained and extremely highly motivated. And we know that in a real war 
not conflict, not uh, fighting here and there for a couple of days, but in a real war, we cannot afford to lose. And the question is, who do we depend on in that situation? That's the real question. Do we depend upon the God of Israel, who has said time and time again, do not depend upon the arm of the flesh, you know, because I am your defense, you know, and look to me, and I will fight for you. If Israel looks to God, God will do it. Uh, he, God has done it in the past, many times in the past. The problem is that Israel becomes very thankful very quickly and then starts to take credit for what God has done shortly thereafter. Like the Six-Day War, everybody says God worked overtime. Everybody. By the time the Yom Kippur War came around seven years later, well, the reason that we won that war was because we had excellent intelligence and we had a very quick army and we were very strong and we were very prepared and we lost too many people in the Yom Kippur War. Pride precedes the fall. And if we depend upon God, O oh Israel, look unto the Lord. If our eyes are fixed on God, God will deal with it. If our, if our strength, if our belief system is based on who we are, and our leaders keep saying, we, we can do it, we are, we are able. And, and this, this scares me, that we have leadership that has ignored our entire history and our biblical history and forgets that anything that we've accomplished is because God has allowed us to do so. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And if we miss that picture, that causes me to be fearful. We're, we're, but we're aware of the situation, and Israel you know, is paying serious attention to what's going on in Egypt uh, because the Sinai has started to flare up again over the last three months or so. Uh, we pay very serious attention to what is going on in Syria because if Assad is deposed, you've got all kinds of small groups that are essentially terrorist groups that there's no central leadership uh, and they can all unify and turn their attention against Israel. In a real sense, it's not that we don't want the, the situation to be resolved. It's that it's better for Assad to be there uh, for Israel, for example, uh, than for him to be deposed and to leave another vacuum that would allow al-Qaeda, who's already in Syria, to step in and, and act in the same manner as the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and become another dictator just removing a, a former dictator. And so the whole business about maybe we can attack uh, Syria because of the use of chemical weapons against its own population, need to be very careful about what we hear in the media. You know? And Russia basically challenged the United States, if you can prove that Assad was using chemical weapons against his own people, then prove it. And what happened about a month ago is that a terrorist group said that they received chemical weapons from Saudi Arabia and that their own people exploded the weapons in an area that, uh, that had Sunni Muslims. And they admitted that. You know, when, when somebody admits something against his own interest, you need to take it seriously. And that was known about a day or so before president got on uh, nationwide TV and said that he was going to attack Syria. So the question is, are we afraid? I don't really think so. Are we concerned? Yes, we're concerned. Why? Because of instability, and we don't want to end up fighting on multiple fronts. That would be problematic. But one instance, not really. Missile attacks, matter of concern. Massive missile attacks, matter of concern. Can we be afraid? You know, there are those who will be afraid. 
nothing you can do about it. For those who know the Lord, be anxious for nothing. And you know, it's easy to say, but God is able to do it. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. So for the brethren, we have a, uh, a, a, a resource that the non-believer doesn't have. Is unsaved Israel concerned? I would say yes. Is the believing community concerned? I think we're more concerned for our children than we are for ourselves. Um, that's just the practical reality of life. Okay, I don't think that we're concerned to the point of, oh my, what are we going to do? You know, but I think it's a realistic concern. Okay? What does the bulk of your people think of our A little louder? You know, it's like I said this morning, uh, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. Uh, what does the country think about your president? Uh, what do I think about our president? Uh, I wouldn't vote for him. I don't think I need to go beyond that. Um, there, there are concerns that I have. You know, it would be nice if uh, a yes would be yes and a no would be no, and, uh, you know, change we could live with. I, I was still trying to figure out before he was elected what change he was talking about. I realized that it was chump change until, uh, until he started doing various uh, things, including changes in the health uh, uh, situation, Obamacare, and, you know, care for the rich and for the, for the poor not so, so much care, um, concern, bowing down to uh, a Muslim king, that concerns me. Uh, in the Middle East, that, that has major significance. Um, uh, setting a deadline uh, for a red line, and the red line becoming a pink line, and then becoming a faded line, that concerns me. Um, you getting my drift? Okay. Do I need to go beyond that? Okay. Thank you. I recently read a headline that the American Jews are not backing Israel. They, they are not a lot, not all, but some are. And why do you think that is? Why do I think that is? I think you have a, a misunderstanding uh, and a drawing back from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As soon as you do that, the perspective becomes more on a uh, humanitarian level. Um, and as maybe uh, Dave and I talked about, first world country um, relating more to third world countries, but not looking at Israel as a third world country, but more as a first world country in the midst of third world countries, and therefore we shouldn't be overly concerned about Israel because Israel can take care of herself. Um, and the Palestinians are considered a third world country, aren't they? Well, I'll get, the, the, I'll get into those who call themselves Palestinians okay. in, in just a minute. The, the thing about American, uh, the American Jewish community is that historically it has tended to be leftist, more liberal, um, and that is because the Jewish people have been the underdogs. We've, uh, we have been the brunt of society over the, the millennia, uh, and so our natural tendency has been to reach out to those who are uh, being taken advantage of, i.e. third world countries, um, and less so for Israel, and uh, in some respects, it could have uh, emphasis on how is this going to affect the economy of the United States that would affect their individual uh, businesses because Israel, you know, if you live over here and there's a problem someplace else, uh, 
You say, well, it's not really my problem, you see? I mean, I said, I have, a, I have a cousin that lives over there, but it's not really my problem. I hope that my cousin is well, and I'll check in on him every now and then, but I'm not going to deal with that. But someplace else, they're really suffering. Is Israel suffering? Israel's not suffering. You know, Israel is a, is a first world country surrounded by third world countries. That's the perspective. And so if you have the, uh, the attitude of we need to help those who are the underdogs, those who are really being oppressed and don't have enough, then the emphasis will shift from trying to help Israel to trying to help somebody else. You know, I, I, again, there are a lot more dynamics that are into it, but that's the essential aspect, how they view it. Um, America, first world country, Middle East, third world country, uh, Far East Asia, third world countries, the fact that some of these countries have more money than America at this point doesn't matter. And the fact that most of the goods and services are being produced in Asia doesn't matter. They're still third world countries from the perspective of, of America. Okay? There's somebody else? Yes? Of your government? <laughs> Let me think about that one, okay? I'm not really, I, I don't really want to get into the thinking of the United States government. You have enough troubles without me adding my opinion to it. Believe me, I could give you four different opinions that I have and they would all be in conflict with one another concerning the present government of the United States. And so I don't want to add to the confusion of what's going on, but that's not a simple question. Uh, or as we would say in rabbinical circles, I can't answer that standing on one foot. How much no. influence does the Muslim Brotherhood have in Israel? In Israel? In Israel. <clears throat> well, I consider Israel to be all of Israel. Uh, they have influence in Gaza, and they have influence in the areas of Samaria under uh, uh, those towns and villages uh, that are primarily Arab-occupied, and the ones that want to divide Israel from southwest to northeast and have a contiguous area, straight, uh, straight road between them and divide Israel so that the, Israel is again divided between north and south and we would be in the territories, they would be straight. Does the Muslim Brotherhood have an influence there? Absolutely. Do they stir people up? Yes, they do. Do they have a major presence there? They don't hang a sign on the door saying, we are the local branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. I assure you they will not do that. Because as soon as they do that, they're in deep trouble. How about, how about their political power within, within, the, within the ruling party of the, com of the country? Are they involved in, in the politics of the country? The Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah. No. no. No, but you do have Arab politicians who are members of Knesset, who, do, who would be very happy to vote Israel out of existence who would be very happy to have the establishment of a Palestinian state in the heart of Israel. Only Israel would allow you know, those who want to destroy her to sit in its decision-making body. Marvin, that's shame here. <laughs> Can you write that down? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, don't hold it. Okay. Our particular news sources are so biased, one side or the other, that you really can't get any uh -huh. answers. Debka, Debka file is very good. Uh, you can plug into Debka.com or DebkaFile.com. Uh, they have regular reporting concerning Israel uh, and the Middle East. They are, are very straightforward. They tell it to you the way that it is. 
Uh, they have a pro-Israel uh, perspective, but they're very straightforward. They're not going to give you uh, something that is not factually true. Could you spell that? D-E-B-K-A. D-E-B-K-A. Start with that. Uh, occasionally you have the Jerusalem Post. Um, the Jerusalem Post has, uh, there's a gal once a week, Carolyn Glick. <clears throat> she has uh, a very good handle on what goes on. I don't agree with her 100%, <clears throat> but I would say that about 95% of the time I do agree with what she writes. She has a, a good political understanding of uh, what's going on in Israel, and she writes a column once a week for the Jerusalem Post. Uh, I would recommend start with that, uh, and the second thing would be take a course in Hebrew, and I can give you a whole bunch of sources that you can take a look at. Okay. Uh, hold it. I must respond to my wife. I can't hear you. Okay, we have my, uh, Orit is referring to a particular Arab member of Knesset uh, who joins in uh, a lot of the demonstrations against uh, Israel and is strongly, strongly supportive of the establishment of a Palestinian state. We're a democratic country. We let even our enemies speak, those who don't love us too much. Rabbi Kaduri? Yeah. Did he leave a message that the Messiah is a Jewish <clears throat> And how did it affect the Orthodox? Okay. The answer is yes, he died. Yes, he was 103. Yes, he left a message, coded. Um, but when you decode it, it said the Messiah, he saw, that he had a vision of the Messiah and that his name was Yehoshua. Yehoshua, not Yeshua. Um, but... Yehoshua can also be Yeshua, uh, same root. Um, how has it affected? It's more or less been kept under wraps. Um, it hasn't affected the, uh, the community at large or the nation at large so much. I mean, there, there were tens of thousands of people who attended his funeral. <clears throat> But in terms of the message that he left, yes, it, yes, he did leave it. It was even published. Uh, there was photo of photo of it, um, but it hasn't really had much of an effect. Okay. Yes, sir. What do you and Manuel think turned the heart of the Israel towards Yeshua? <clears throat> Yeshua was a Jew. Towards Yeshua, or directly towards Yeshua. Israel needs to be at a point of desperation to call out to God. Needs to be totally dependent upon God. God save us, we have no other source. And they will try every other source and they will run out of every possibility before they turn to God. But when they turn to God, they will do so wholeheartedly expecting him to act on their behalf. And then there will be the things that they have heard concerning Messiah Yeshua. They will look upon him, who they will look upon me, God says, uh, Zechariah 12.10, that they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only begotten son. Then the national prayer of repentance, Isaiah 53, will come to pass. All right, and then they will say, come, come, save us. Um, in line with uh, Matthew 23, verses 37, 38, 39, uh, I will not come until you say, come, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, they will call out, that is a messianic invitation. They will say, come, you know, we bless you in the name of the Lord. They will call upon uh, the Lord, but it will be persecution. Two-thirds of Israel will die will be killed. Uh, it will be an extreme situation 
but they will have no choice, no place to look. They'll turn right, they'll turn left like the children who, of Israel who left Egypt. They got, to the, uh, they got to the sea. There was no place to turn back. And they couldn't go to the right because of the mountain. They couldn't go to the left because of the mountain. They couldn't go straight because of the water. They had no place to turn except God, and God parted the waters. And that's what they will look for. God would part the waters for them in a military situation. Okay. I know he will. So if you have more questions, come up. Come up <coughs> to my friend. And, uh, but right now I think we'll close, so some of you who need to go can do so. But please, if you have more questions, come. Uh, he's a great resource, my friend. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you again for being our God. I thank you for the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Thanks, Lord. We're thrilled. We're thrilled for a number of reasons, one of which is Yeshua will come soon. Mm. Amen. And Israel will turn to him whom they mm, have too pierced. Much. They will embrace him as Savior and Lord, and he will save them. And then he will establish this glorious king that will benefit all of us. We are blessed through Israel. Mm. We're blessed because Israel gave us a sacrifice for our terrible sins. Mm. We're blessed because Israel is going to supply a king who will at long last rule this world the way it should be ruled. Amen. We're eager for that time. In the meantime, I pray for peace in Jerusalem. I pray that you protect Israel, especially protect those Jews in Israel who have embraced the Messiah. Hmm. Protect them. Yes, Lord God. Bless them. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, folks. Come talk tomorrow.